Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for attending this week's session of Remote Sensing Applications for Disasters Management. My name is Brock Levins, and I'll be hosting today's session. This week, for week two, we have two guest presenters, Cindy Schmidt and Amber McCollum. Cindy and Amber head up our ecological forecasting and land management, as well as the wildfire application themes for our set. And they will be speaking today about their use of remote sensing for wildfire application disasters. First, we'll start off with Amber. Amber McCollum is a research assistant at the Earth Sciences Division at NASA Ames Research Center. She is, a, she is a PhD candidate at the University of California, Santa Cruz, in environmental studies. And Dr. Cindy Schmidt will follow with a, uh, with a presentation. Um, she is a research scientist at the Earth Sciences Division at Ames as well. She has over 20 years of experience in using remote sensing and GIS technology for natural resource management, urban planning, and human health risk assessments. As always, you can find each week's presentations in PDF format. Any recordings of the sessions, they will be uploaded to our web page, as you see here, as well as any links to the homework assignments. Uh, without further ado, I will pass this on to Cindy and Amber. And thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you, Brock. And thank you all for being here today. Um, this week, we will discuss the issues related to wildfires globally and how remote sensing can be used to address management issues. We will provide examples of specific products available for wildfires, such as the MODIS Thermal Anomalies product. We will also introduce online tools that can be used to identify active fires and to download data that can be used for burned area mapping. So what are the critical issues with wildfires globally? Wildfires are a natural occurrence in many areas and are necessary for the health of the forest and other ecosystems. However, years of wildfire repression and drought conditions have resulted in larger, more intense, and sometimes more frequent fires. This is particularly concerning when the fires occur near human populations, <clears throat> resulting in loss of life and property, as well as destroying valuable ecosystems. Smoke from wildfires creates poor air quality and are of great concern with those who have respiratory illness. Wildfires are also, also result in habitat loss and changes to the hydrologic regime. Remotely sensed imagery can help provide managers with information to help manage wildfires before, during, and after events. Some of the management questions that remote sensing can be used to address are, what are the pre- and post-burn forest conditions? What are the social and economic aspects of wildfires? Although this can't be necessarily addressed directly by remote sensing, it is critical to incorporate into results derived from remote sensing. How are land use changes affecting fire regimes? And how can remote sensing be used to improve fire response measures and pre- and post-burn mitigation efforts. So first we will review burn severity mapping and then discuss the remotely sensed products available for wildfire applications. Landsat imagery is often used to assess post-fire severity in burned regions. Burn severity mapping can be conducted using a fairly simple change detection approach using a pre- and post-fire image. The image on the left, this one here, is a Landsat image of a fire that occurred in Idaho in 2007. That, combined with a pre-fire image, can be used to create this image on the right. This is a burn severity map. The red areas in this figure show where the highest burn severity occurred. On the next few slides, I will discuss how the burn severity maps are created. In order to understand how to create a burn severity map, it's important to understand the basics of spectral signatures. These, concept are, are, these concepts were covered in the Fundamentals of Remote Sensing webinar, 
But I wanted to review this a little bit here. This image shows a spectral signature curves from the visible spectrum to the infrared portion of the spectrum. The healthy vegetation signature is in green. The dry, bare soil is in brown. And the clear water is in blue. All objects on the ground have different spectral signatures, as shown in this figure. But we're just going to focus on this healthy vegetation curve for now. As you recall, healthy vegetation reflects a little in the green wavelength, absorbs in the red wavelength, and really reflects in the near-infrared wavelengths here. Healthy vegetation also absorbs the longer short wave near the short wave infrared wavelengths. To create burn severity maps, we must know how the spectral curves of different levels of burn severity um, are and compare that to unburned healthy vegetation. Sorry, everyone. I think I um, just got disconnected, but I'm right back. Can you all let me know if you can hear me? OK, great. <laughs> quickly, quickly back, so we're good. OK, so to create burn, right. So to create burn severity maps, we must know the spectral curves of the different levels of burn severity and how they compare, compare to unburned healthy vegetation. So this is really the underlying science behind how we create all land cover maps. So here are some generalized spectral response curves for hypothetical low, moderate, and high burn severity. The low is in light blue here. The moderate is in yellow, and the red is a high burn severity. To assess the severity of the fire, you can compare how the spectral signatures of the burned areas compare to spectral signatures of healthy vegetation. Creating burn severity maps exploits the differences between the healthy vegetation and the burned areas in specific wavelengths. This image shows that the largest differences occur in the near infrared and the short wave wavelengths. In the near infrared wavelengths, the healthy vegetation has a much higher reflectance than the burned areas here. In the short wave infrared wavelengths, the burned areas have a higher reflectance than the healthy vegetation. Creating a burn severity map from Landsat imagery requires calculating a ratio between the near infrared and short wave infrared bands called the normalized burn ratio for both the pre fire and post fire images. The ratio is shown here on the left. Some sensors do not have a short wave infrared band, so a similar approach called the normalized difference vegetation index, or NDVI, can be used with the near infrared and red bands. The ratio, this ratio is shown here. Once these maps are created, the post fire map is subtracted from the pre fire map to create a difference normalized burn ratio, or DNBR. The burned areas are then categorized into low, medium, and high burn severity to create the burned area reflectance classification, or BARC map. Now we will discuss the remotely sensed products available for wildfire applications. NASA satellite data have multiple uses for assessing pre-fire conditions, for identifying active fire locations, and for post-fire mapping of burned areas. For pre-fire mapping, satellite imagery is used to assess vegetation density and health and drought severity prior to fire outbreaks. This information is used along with soil moisture, topography, and other environmental variables in fire models to determine fire behavior in certain conditions. This information can then be used to treat high-risk areas to reduce fire threat. During a wildfire event, satellite imagery is used to monitor wildfire status 
including the location of wildfire front, as well as the total area currently burning. After a wildfire, satellite imagery is also used to determine total area burned and the severity of the fire, as we just discussed. Products useful for wildfire applications are primarily available from Landsat, MODIS, and VIRS. Landsat data, available at 30 meter spatial resolution every 16 days, can provide information on vegetation health and post-fire mapping. The Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectral Radiometer, or MODIS, is a useful sensor for wildfires due to its high temporal resolution. Images are available daily. The VIR sensor is similar to MODIS in terms of temporal resolution with some spatial resolution improvements. We will be providing information about the products that are generated from these sensors, including land fire, thermal anomalies, burned area, and the active fire product. Land fire is a joint U.S. Forest Service and U.S. Geological Survey program that was designed to improve fire and natural resource management. It provides a national inventory of geospatial data, including vegetation composition and structure, fire behavior and effects, fuel loading models, and fire regime conditions of the entire United States from 2006 to present. Multiple data products are available. These are organized into groups which include disturbance, vegetation, fuel, fire regime, and topographic data. Products are delivered at a 30 meter spatial resolution for landscape scale analysis, which is great for national and regional planning because products are updated every two years to reflect changes in landscapes over time. Now we will discuss some MODIS products. The MODIS thermal anomalies and fire product provides a snapshot of both actively burning fires and burned areas globally. MODIS's mid-infrared band allows the instrument to identify the locations of thermal anomalies, thus active fires. This product provides unique dimensions, such as a fire mask, and a table that lists each fire pixel. The fire pixel table characterizes 19 attributes for fire pixels, including maximum fire radiative power. The MODIS algorithm used to map burned areas takes advantage of the spectral, temporal, and structural changes caused by fires due to the deposits of charcoal ash, removal of vegetation, and vegetation structure change. The algorithm detects the approximate date of burning at 500 meters and maps the spatial extent of recent fires by analyzing daily surface reflectance and a model-based change detection algorithm to locate rapid changes on the Earth's surface. On the right is a burned area image here for subectorial Africa for fires detected between August and October of 2000. The different colors indicate the approximate day of burning, with the blue colors detected in August, and the green in, in September, and the red in October. So you can see some of those colors mapped out here. The VIR sensor was launched aboard the Suomi NPP satellite in October 2011, and in 2012, the thermal portion of the sensor began operation with the active fire product released in October of 2012. The VIRS product use, uses the M band at 750 meters and the I band at 375 meter resolution. The I band pr products are still in beta version and they are currently trying to improve the spatial resolution to 350 meters. The active fire product can be viewed and downloaded on the VIRS active fire web page, which we will demonstrate later. So I'll now hand it over to my colleague, Cindy Schmidt, to talk to you about remote sensing wildfire web tools. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to go over some web tools um, and then do a couple demonstrations at the end. There's uh, multiple web tools available to visualize and download imagery and maps. In this portion of the webinar, I'm going to describe the Fire Information for Resource Management System, or FIRMS, 
the VIRS active fire maps, which we just mentioned, and the US Forest Service active fire mapping program, and lastly, NASA Worldview. First, I'll talk about firms. The Fire Information for Resource Management System, or FIRMS, was developed by the University of Maryland with support from NASA's Applied Sciences Program and the UN Food and Agriculture Organization to provide near real-time active fire locations to natural resource managers that faced challenges obtaining timely satellite-derived fire information. FIRMS delivers MODIS and VIRS hotspot fire locations on a near real-time basis in easy-to-use formats. You can also get the MODIS burned area images from this website that Amber mentioned earlier. MODIS active fire data detection data represents the center of a one kilometer pixel that has been flagged as containing one or more actively burning hotspots and or areas. Fires are only detected if they're burning at the time of the overpass. Additionally, fires may not be detected if they are cool fires or small fires and or they are obscured by smoke or clouds. MODIS takes daily images of the Earth, but there are gaps in coverage at the equator, so these data are available every one to two days. Data older than seven days are available using an active down, archive download, to, download tool. The data are available in various GIS-friendly formats and can be visualized online via the Web Fire Mapper or NASA's WorldView. The one kilometer MODIS data and the 375 meter VIRS data can be downloaded in multiple formats including shapefile, which can be used in ArcGIS or QGIS, or KML, which of course can be viewed in Google Earth. You can download the data for the last 24 or 48 hours or for the last seven days. You can download the, the data globally or for large regions that you specify. The data will then display each pixel where a fire was detected within, within your time frame of choice. For example, if you're interested in a currently burning or a very recent fire, you can download the data within the last 24 hours. To show you an example of what these data look like in Google Earth, we downloaded some recent 375 meter VIRS data as a KML file from the Canadian fires near Fort McMurray by clicking on the 24 hour download icon for Canada, which you can see circled in red here. This is what the VIRS data look like in Google Earth. Each fire icon represents a different fire detection area. And here's the location of the Fort McMurray fire as of June 7, 2016. This wildfire, which began on May 1, 2016, is one of the most damaging fires in Canadian history and has burned over 1.4 million acres and as of June 7 was only was 70% contained. You can also download archived MODIS fire data older than the last seven days. These data are available as shapefiles or text files. You have to request the information through firms and the instructions on how to download the data will be emailed to you. You can specify the area you want by drawing a polygon on the map by clicking the area that's circled in red here or by specifying the coordinates of the rectangle. When you scroll down on that same screen, you can specify the dates you're interested in as well as the output format and your email address. You can then submit your request. The next thing I'm going to tell you about is the VIRS Active Fire Maps website. This website has a visualization tool for you to identify active fire locations and instructions on how to download the fire detects and imagery. This site has two different maps. 
One is for the contiguous United States, and one is the global active fire map. On the CONUS active fire map, you can view active fire detections and download VIRS imagery and fire detect locations in GeoTIFF, ASCII, and KMZ formats. On the global active fire map, you can only view the active and archive fire detections. You can't download any data. A tutorial for downloading the data is also available on the website. On the CONUS active fire map, you can see the M-band icons in red and yellow and the I-band icons in blue. As a reminder, the M-band data are 750 meters and the I-band data are 375 meters. The fire icons represent daytime detections for the preceding day, and so each fire icon is a detection from the past 24 hours. The red icons show the center of the sat satellite granules. If you click on a satellite icon, you can see the RGB M-band and I-band quick looks. You can also download the RGB as a GeoTIFF, as well as the M and I-band detections for the entire day as an ASCII or KMZ file. Now we'll zoom into the fire detects for the Fort McMurray fire in Canada. You can now see the location of the fire as of May 23rd, 2016. You can also switch from the map view to the satellite view by clicking up here in the upper left-hand corner. So here's the satellite view. If you zoom in even further and turn off the M-band detects, you can see the locations of, of the 375 meter pixels from the I-band. The different colors represent varying intensities of the fire, with red representing the highest intensity. This is the global active fire map. You can see the active fire locations, but not the sat satellite granules. In this image from May 2016, you can see the large number of detections in Mexico and Central America, as well as Western and South Central Africa. You can look at archive data by clicking on any date from the drop-down box shown here. So next I'm going to talk to you about the U.S. Forest Service Active Fire Mapping Program, which provides fire detection activity for the contiguous U.S., Alaska, and Hawaii. This program is an operational satellite-based fire detection and monitoring program managed by the U.S. Forest Service Remote Sensing Application Center, or, or, or RSAC. This program provides near real-time detection and character of wildfire conditions in a geospatial context. The primary remote sensing data used are from the MODIS instrument, but they also integrate data from NOAA's GOES and AVHRR, and more recently, VIRS. Satellite data are continually relayed to RSAC, integrated, and processed to produce imagery and science data products. These products include fire mapping and visualization products, fire detection GIS data sets, and live data services, multispectral image subsets, and analytical products and summaries. You can visualize any of the MODIS, FEARS, Landsat, AVHRR, or GOES fire data in Google Earth. I will demonstrate how you can look at the VIRS fire detect data in Google Earth. First, click on the VIRS icon, icon that's circled in red here. Once you do that, you can select the 750 meter or the 375 meter VIRS data or other data in Google Earth. If you click on this VIRS 375 meter current selection, you will get the KML file that will enable you to view the data in Google Earth. 
As you can see, the points are color-coded by date of detection, with red being the last 0 to 6 hours, orange being the last 12 to 24 hours, <clears throat> and yellow being the 6 days previous to the last 24 hours. Lastly, I will show you how to visualize and download MODIS Active Fires data from NASA's WorldView. When you first open WorldView, you will see the current MODIS True Color image. You can see the list of base layers and overlays on the left hand side over here. So there's overlays, and here's the base layers. The data that are visible are those that are highlighted. In this case, you can see the coastlines here and the MODIS corrected reflectance down here. On the bottom is the slider bar where you can select this date, the date, and in this case, we're looking at imagery from May 31st, 2016. So here this, here's the slider bar on the bottom. You can see the current the date that we're viewing right now, which is May 31st, and across the bottom, you can actually slide it to, um, to any date available. I will first turn on the coastlines, borders, roads layer, so you can see the country boundaries. So now you can see the country boundaries overlaid on the imagery here in gray. They're a little light, but you can still see them. Next, we will click on Add Layers to display different MODIS imagery. So here's Add Layers right here. When you click on Add Layers, you have several options for choosing imagery. At the top, you can see these data are classified by different hazards and disasters. So right here. So this whole list is all hazards and disasters. A second tab, which is right here, gives you the option of identifying data through different science disciplines. If we go to fires, we will select fires and thermal anomalies right here. Under fires and thermal anomalies on the left, you can see you can choose data from different instruments. And I'll point that out right here. So you can see Terra Modis, Aqua and Terra Modis, Suomi NPP Veers, and aqua modus. For, for now, we're just going to leave it on aqua and terra modus. And so the next step is to click on the fires and thermal anomalies box. Notice that below this box, you can see a description of the data. Now you can close this box by clicking the X on the top right, right there. So now you will be able to see fire and thermal anomalies data listed under overlays on the top left, which is right here. And you can see the data overlaid on the MODIS imagery, so all those red dots there. I was interested in visualizing the fires in Angola. So in the active data list, I turned on the place labels which is right here, zoomed in a bit more, and then you can notice that I moved the date back one day because there were more fires in Angola on May 30th than on May 31st. So right here, now you see we're at May 30th. Notice the gaps in the imagery. So you can see these large gaps right here. This is where the Terra satellite paths do not overlap. So let's take a look at the Aqua Satellite Pass to see how they differ. 
So if you notice, on the left-hand side, I've switched from Terra as a base layer to Aqua as a base layer. So now you can see the gaps going the other way to follow the direction of the Aqua satellite path. Now we're going to select the VIRS base layer. Right here, you can see the VIRS base layer. And as you can see, there are no gaps in the VIRS base layer because the adjacent satellite paths overlap each other. I think it's much easier to see the fire data and the countries this way. So we'll leave, it, we'll leave the, ba the VIRS base layer on. Now we want to try to download the FIRES data. So if you look up here at this icon, I've circled the download um, button. So this is what you get when you click the download button. You get this list of data available for download and also data not available for download. You can see that the combined Terra and Aqua MODIS fires and thermal anomalies data are not available for download. So you can see it right here. It says not available for download, and it gives you this whole list of data not available. In order to download these data, you actually need to select Terra or Aqua data. So we'll go back and do that. So we'll go back to the active layers and then click Add layers again, right there circled in red. Then we'll choose fires and thermal anomalies again, right here. And then, instead of aqua and terra modus, we'll just choose terra modus. and then turn on fires and thermal anomalies in this checkbox right there. We're also going to display the aqua modus. So you can choose the aqua modus right here and click on the fires and thermal anomalies box as well. This will allow you to compare the numbers of fires you can see between the two instruments. So now we'll close the box with this X right here. So now we have both the aqua and terra fires turned on. OK, if you click off aqua and just leave terra, you can see how many active fires there are captured by this instrument. So really, in this area, there's, just, there's not that many fires captured by the terra instrument. If you click on Aqua and click off Terra, you can see how many more fires and thermal anomalies this sensor captures. So we're going to stay with the Aqua um, data to download. <clears throat> so now up here, we're going to click on the download button again, and we'll see what happens. So now you can see the data available for download and the data not available for download. So the aqua, fire, and thermal anomalies data are available for download. You will also notice that you need to choose which image you would like to download. And you can do that by clicking on the yellow circles right here with the pluses in them. These are the center points for the imagery. When you click one of the circles, you will see the outline of that particular MODIS imagery. So you can see the outline here kind of in this gray color. You will also see that under Download Data, it now says one selected right here. This image seems to cover our area of interest really well. So now you would just click the Download Data button which is right here. Note that you are not getting the MODIS true color imagery. So you're not getting that base layer. You're only getting the fire detection pixels.
Okay, at this point we're going to conclude this webinar series on um, wildfire applications. Um, I do want to remind you that we did a full five-week webinar on uh, wildfire applications um, that's available on the RSET website. So if you want more information about any of this, um, and more actually, um, I highly encourage you to go to, the, to go to our RSET website and take a look at our wildfire uh, webinar series. We do have plenty of time for questions, um, and you can also feel free to email us, um, me or Amber, with any follow-up questions that you may have. So here's our contact emails, um, and also the email for Anna Prados um, if you have any general RSET-related questions.